back in our father's words, Song of Solomon, greatest love story ever told. Um, I feel definitely that it has to do with God's election. Is that little represented by that little country girl from uh, the Shulamite, from Shenyin, which is to say a double resting place. And naturally, who is our shepherd, the shepherd that she loved? There's only one, really. That's uh, the Lord is our shepherd, and we shall never want when we remember that. You'll remember she is the only daughter of a widowed mother, and she has many brothers. And her beauty and the fact that she was a sheep tender of sheep and then her brothers when she met a little shepherd put her in the vineyard because they, they were protecting her and then Solomon himself the very king of Israel saw her and he began to court her to try to pull her away from that shepherd boy and naturally the, the ultimate reason is with this always being read at Passover where that shepherd would become our Passover as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 and 8 um, then uh, it is read there so that it um, brings that truth forward to us of how we feed the sheep how we take care of the flock and who is that head shepherd king of kings and lord of lords you will remember in chapter 4, as we closed, the little Shulamite closed it by saying, Awake, O north wind, and come without south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. That pollen of God's truth can flow out to the world. Uh, let my beloved come in, into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Let, let, let that shepherd come and enjoy the proceeds of his teaching of his word. And of course, uh, this is put forward in the sense of love, whereby you emotionally can understand the feelings of our Father spiritually. Chapter 5, verse 1, the um, shepherd answers that statement she just made. That's why we covered it. Here is his answer. Verse 1, chapter 5. I am come into my garden my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And then the um, eat, and then the daughters of Jerusalem chime in and say, Oh, friends, drink. Yea, drink abundantly, O oh, beloved. Uh, oh, dearly beloved. In other words, uh, here they, they hear this word, and finally, and then the Shulamite then speaks up again. I sleep, but my heart waketh. In other words, what is she? She's dreaming. Okay, this is a dream. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, uh, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks, uh, my curly hair, with the drops of the night. In other words, I have the very dew of the night upon me. Open and uh, allow me in. Verse 3, and the girl continues. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? And she continues with her dream in verse 4. My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, that latch right there, and my bowels were moved for him. I, from very deep within inside, my love went forth, reaching out to him in this dream. As, as the, the little shepherd reached for that latch, the very door. The beauty of this is, is that Christ on the cross rent that veil where that door is always open to us to commune with that shepherd. Verse 5, she continues, I rose up to open my beloved, to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the hands, handles of the lock. In other words, in this dream she could that fragrance of the nearness of that shepherd that meant everything to her. 
verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed him when he spake. And I want you to underline the word soul to let you know that we're speaking spiritual here. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. How many times people in searching for the truth in searching for the through and for the Word of God, in searching for that shepherd, in knowing how he would lead their life as they reach out to that comforter, which can be symbolic of a, this dream in a sense that you, you search for and you knew all the time in your as one of God's elect, the love you had for his truth. And though you could not absorb all that truth, with understanding, you thirst for it. You hungered for it. To know what he would have you do. Why? Because you love him. Because you want to be pleasing to him. And then wake and it was all a dream. He wasn't there. In verse 7 she continues, The watchman that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. That's, that's, that's the most disrespectful thing you can do to a maiden in this part of the country. They, um, and of course, it, it's a gross insult. And she felt insulted. And, and how it was that, uh, and she continues then after that terrible thing that happened to her, in this dream, verse 8, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. I mean, I'm lovesick for him. If you see him, tell him. And, and the daughters, and those daughters of Jerusalem answer her, What is thy beloved uh, more than another beloved? What is so special about him? O oh, thou fairest among women. Now at least they're being respectful to her. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? That thou dost so charge us. Why is he better than Solomon, you might say? Because Solomon was certainly courting her. I mean, he, he was snowing her under. Remember, he even sent the sedan for her, the chair with, with 60 armed men to protect her. But she was having none of it. Why? Because of the shepherd. Why is he more? Because he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's the king we wanted coming out the gate rather than some man king. A man king cannot lead. A man king is not perfect by any means. And uh, men uh, in leadership can ruin a nation. The shepherd can save a nation. That's why he is so special, and that's why the Shulamite, the wealth and the ways of this world meant nothing to her. She longed for that shepherd. The daughters of Jerusalem, hey, they're not all that uh, in love with the shepherd because they would rather have the things of the world. You can read in Ezekiel about these same women, which they signify. In Ezekiel chapter 13, beginning with verse 18, where, where God himself says, You daughters of Jerusalem, you sew these kerchiefs to hide every knuckle in my outreach-saving arms. This is the shepherd. And you teach my people to fly to save their souls, and I'm against it. That's the word of our Father concerning these daughters of Jerusalem that will mislead, will take on whatever king they can grab that comes by first, rather than studying God's word and staying true to the shepherd. And we continue with the next verse. Verse 10. The, female, the Shulamite begins to say again, My beloved is white and ruddy, 
He shows blood in the face. The chiefest among 10,000. He's different. There's none other like him. Verse 11. His head is as the most fine gold. Are bushy, they're curly, and black as a raven. Um, he, he's outstanding. Verse 12, his eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. Uh, they perfectly are set in his head. What does it mean that there's the eyes of the doves by the rivers? A double reflection, a double witness, the beauty of seeing the, the shepherd in his reflection in that water of the river and, and seeing the stately comfort that he would bring as the shepherd of shepherds, the tender of the flock, the pasture you would of, of the sheep that are symbolic of our people. And none can compare to him. I'm going to tell you something in this troubled world today. You had better recognize the fact. Nothing in this world compares to the beauty of the Savior and the eternity that is to come compared to what you see in this world. What, how is he different? 10,000 times better. The Shulamite continues. His cheeks or as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers, his lips like lilies, uh, drop being sweet smelling myrrh. Uh, his, his um, the, the very um, cheek and his person are as a fount of perfume, if you would, his nearness. That's the spirit pulling, pouring forth from him and how precious it is in her mind as she visualizes that Savior of saviors, the shepherd of shepherds. Verse 14, his hands are as gold rings set with the burl, and um, they're outstretched. His hands are outstretched. Don't you let the daughters of Jerusalem sew kerchiefs to go over those outreach saving arms. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. He he, and he stands mighty to save. Here is where um, you, you want to know his hands. For the right hand is the symbol of power. And as I've stated before in Ezekiel 13, you have an interesting thing there, following verse 18 concerning the daughters of Jerusalem. Many of you, your newer translations, the Kenites have taken out the fact that God doesn't want you to teach his children, the flock, to fly to save their souls. His saving arms are sufficient. They get it done. That's why the strength of his hands and the power of his stomach can stand any test that Satan might bring against it. It is no wonder the Shulamite falls in love. And is it any wonder that God's elect fall in love with God himself through the Son to try to bring as many people as possible, the lambs, the sheep, to feed them that flock the shepherd tends to bring into the truth and away from the mischief of the daughters of Jerusalem and the teachings of Satan. Again, I gave you a proof of it. Read some of your later Bibles. The term you teach my children to fly and I'm against it has been changed to birds flying. It's a bunch of birds, all right. It's a bunch of birds that changed it. And they have a reason for changing it. They want people to believe in the flying doctrine, which is false. She continues then, 15. His legs are as pillars of marble, set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. In other words, that is the finest wood that you can create um, safety places from because that cedar drives away 
any moth or anything that might even damage the precious garments or people. And that's what it, why it is symbolic of our people. And the word Lebanon means white. And the, the, the cedars of it, so powerful. And, and she completes here with verse 16, the female still talking. And this is her words. Listen to them carefully. What sets him aside from others? The daughters of Jerusalem want to know. I mean, I mean Solomon was courting her with everything in the world. This world, not that one. And she refused him. The daughters of Jerusalem could hardly understand that. But here's one of the main reasons. Listen to it. 16. His mouth is most sweet. I, I would rather translate this, his words are most sweet. What it really is, says is his voice is most sweet, but his voice is his word. And his word is the living word. His word is what the shepherd uses and his sheep know his voice. They do not know the voice of the evil one, but they know the voice of the shepherd. And his voice is sweet to the ear because it brings forth truth and knowledge and understanding. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. He's uh, saying he is fervently desired over anything that you people might bring forth. <clears throat> and certainly his voice and his word, his teaching, and we're hearing it now. This is his way of bringing his voice forth. Utilizing terminology that we understand in the flesh, but yet it has to do with the soul, which is spiritual, letting us know how his emotions feel in regards to loving that little Shulamite girl which is symbolic of his elect, the upright ones, how he cares, how he sees you in the spirit, your spiritual body, perfect, how precious it is to make that stand. As his legs of ivory, they do not give way. They take ground. They do not give one inch to Satan. They take that ground. It through his voice, which is a two-edged sword that cuts both ways, his truth supreme. Don't let anyone change the word of God on you, for that voice is the power. And deception is the main guile and trick that Satan utilizes to deceive the world. Um, chapter 6. Verse 1, those daughters of Jerusalem watch them. This is what they say. Whither is thy beloved gone? Thou fairest among women. At least they're showing a little respect for her. Whither is thy beloved turned aside? That we may seek him with thee. And she answers, uh, my beloved has gone down into his garden to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Now, I want you to know, to gather lilies, he's in the garden, the comforter is there. And who is the elect other than the lily, the, the, the lily of the valley? Sharon, that is that wild flower. He gathers his elect. He cares for them. That's what she's saying here. He, he cares for his children. That's why he's a shepherd. He's in his garden, tending it, taking care of business, as he should. Three, I am my beloved's. And when you're a servant of the living God, you had better be his. And my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies, and naturally he feeds, if you would, he feeds his flock as a shepherd, and he also feeds from the lilies. That is to say, his love for his election, and they return that love. 
Oh, how precious it is to have known since you were a child there was more to God's Word than you'd been taught. He cared. And He would guide you through life to bring you to that place whereby you could hear that truth and know that truth and embellish it and know the food that is supposed to go forth is the very food that was ministered in the 16th verse of the last chapter which is to say his voice. It's yours when you partake of it. It's yours. And he, uh, he is yours and you are his. When you love that word and when you love that truth. Um, now, <clears throat> the rest of this chapter will be taken up mostly by Solomon. I mean, he's observed this going on. He loves this girl. I mean, he has, he has uh, wives and concubines a glory. He does not have this Shulamite, which means a double resting place, this beautiful girl, tanned from working in nature, the sun, in the vineyard, and caring for sheep. He doesn't have her, but he's trying to win her. And he begins talking here in the fourth verse, this from Solomon. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tarzah. God, that's delight. What a delight you are. Calmly, beautiful as Jerusalem. Terrible, let's just say awe-inspiring as an army with banners. <clears throat> now, you might, compared to the shepherd, think about that a moment. What does Solomon see when he sees her? He, he doesn't see. Uh, it's important that you note this. He's going to repeat some words that the shepherd did. But there's one thing the shepherd never accomplished. He never compared her to an army with banners. Okay? Only an earthly king would do a thing like that. An army with banners, his flying is what would be important or most important or supreme to an earthly king. That's why you don't want to serve an earthly king. You want the heavenly king. Verse 5, Solomon continues, Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilad. Now, here, uh, you might remember, uh, and I want you to do it, chapter two, verse 2 of chapter 4, what did the shepherd tell her? Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep, or as well shorn, which come up after the washing. Listen to what Solomon says in verse 6, Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep, which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. The exact words that the shepherd said, with the exception of a few clauses, letting you know where his mind truly is. About an army and its banners and things of the world. Why I want you to note this is false teachings are very seductive. They can say the same thing, but their inner meaning is totally different. They have different thoughts about you. Next verse, we continue, verse 7. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's beautiful behind your veil. Eight. There are <clears throat> three score queens and fourscore concubines and virgins without number. Solomon says, I have 60 wives and 80 concubines and virgins without number. And my dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She's the only daughter. Is the choice of one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines 
and they praised her. Let's just say they praised God's elect. You know, it is precious to be one of God's election. doesn't make you any better than anyone else. But at least you weren't deceived in the first earth age. And praise be to God, don't let men's words deceive you in this earth age. He, both persuasions in courting her could be likened to the same with the exception of the fact true love. True love, that means to care really what happens. Even tough love when it's necessary. That is true love. That shepherd loves this girl, and this girl loves that shepherd. Uh, this girl is that shepherd's, and the shepherd is, belongs to that girl. He belongs to whomsoever will. Whomsoever will listen, whomsoever will hear him. But here you have um, this one saying, I, I've got all of these things, but you mean more to me than any of them put together. Well, now that in itself does not ring all that precious, okay? I mean, um, so with um, he, he could have this house, Solomon did, but it didn't mean anything to her because she loved that shepherd boy, the tender of the sheep the tender of the flock, the voice that held the truth. Verse 10 to continue, he keeps talking. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. This is where the king leaves it. He can't get this army with banners out of his head. That's not going to influence her one iota. That will not deceive her because she knows that shepherd boy and she knows that he cares for the sheep. He cares for the flock, which is our people. That's what is important to her. Why? Because she loves the flock also. She was the tender of it. And even he would feed from the lilies. Even he feeds from God's elect. Why? Desiring their love to be returned to him so that he has this, this family. And that family is um, the shepherd's foe. And then here in verse 11, the Shulamite answers him. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley. That's what she had been listening to, all right? A bunch of fruits and a bunch of nuts. You want to be careful of that today. They run about. A lot of nuts in this world and a lot of fruits. And to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranate budded. Um, and that's what the garden is about. What does it produce? A garden is supposed to produce, or it gets cut off. In verse 12, she continues, Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Amminadib. And what, what this means is, is, um, the chariots make me so homesick. Homesick to be with he that is my choice. Homesick to be with that little shepherd. Um, and here we have uh, what, what this means is the will of the people. The will of the people brings me back and makes me homesick. Uh, Amen, I did. Verse 13 to complete the chapter. And here we have those young women of Jerusalem. They begin this sentence that there will be three different people speaking in this verse, so you have to pay close attention. It starts with the daughters of Jerusalem. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. In other words, come back. What will you see 
in the Shulam, the, and then the Shulamite answers uh, the daughters of Jerusalem, what will you see in the Shulamite? And then the male answers, as it were the company of two armies. Now, what is important is the word armies here is me'ananam. Do you know where that is written? In Genesis 32, you've got to go all the way back to there. That's the two armies. The two armies that met there, who were they? In Genesis 32. The two armies that met there was um, Jacob and Esau. Jacob's army and Esau's army. They met, and Jacob was a little cautious, if you will remember. But Esau was glad to see his brother and made him welcome. God has a way of working things out when you allow him. Even the two armies did not fight was able to pull them together and with the love of God brought brothers together and overcame the evil of that moment and that time. So don't ever forget it. Solomon is wooing this beautiful girl. He, he has the whole house but he wants this girl. He uses the same words of the shepherd and he's not sincere. He compares her to an army with banners, which means all he can see is power of the world, where the shepherd tends the flock. He cares about using his powers to lead the people, to comfort them, to love them, and have that love returned. All right, don't miss the next lecture. The close brings it all together. Listen a moment, won't you please?